and welcome back to Petroleum Downstream Crash Course. Today we're going to talk about the vacuum distillation column. Now in the last video, we actually talked about long residue, which came out of our atmospheric tower. Now it came out of our atmospheric tower, distillation tower. So what are we going to do with it? One of the options is to send it to a vacuum distillation tower. And what is happens in this vacuum distillation tower? You heat up the long residue. Uh, let me cover that up. You heat up the vacuum, the long residue. Send it to a vacuum distillation tower. And you withdraw extra, extra fractions from it. So what comes out the bottom after you get out the lighter fractions in this vacuum distillation tower will be called heavy gas oil and light gas oil or heavy vacuum gas oil and light vacuum gas oil these are the main products you want and what comes out the bottom is known as short residue SR or vacuum residue or vacuum reduced crude and sometimes they also call it asphalt so those are the main fractions from your vacuum distillation tower and what's the typical pressure? Sometimes it can be a heavy vacuum from 25 to 40 millimeters of mercury. So this is a pressure measurement where one atmosphere of pressure is 760 millimeters mercury, thereabouts. So this, uh, these are typical pressures. You can go a bit higher if you want a milder vacuum for cost reasons. And the reason that uh, vacuum towers are used again is to reduce the boiling point of the crude oil of course it's a very expensive operation one is that one reason is because a compressor has to work very hard to make a vacuum and two you have to make a very thick vessel and big vessel in fact so that uh, you can accommodate more vapor and you can accommodate the force of the atmosphere pressing in on the tower just think of a submarine or space shuttle if you want to think of the cost of reinforcing the hull and containment of this uh, vacuum distillation column. So, just want to introduce you the boiling points, the typical boiling points of light vacuum gas oil, heavy vacuum gas oil, and vacuum residue or short residue. For light vacuum gas oil, it's heavier than heavy vacuum gas oil, or heavier than heavy gas oil or atmospheric gas oil all right this one ends around to 420 degrees C so below that it will be the light vacuum gas oil it has a boiling point of about 420 to 510 degrees C in our vacuum tower heavy vacuum gas oil has a boiling point a boiling point of 510 to 565 C at one atmosphere of pressure and vacuum residue has a boiling point of 565 C and above, or 1050 Fahrenheit and above. So what is their boiling point at atmospheric, at the vacuum pressures? Vacuum pressures will lower the boiling point of light vacuum gas oil. So here now, here I can draw off my light vacuum gas oil cuts at 170 to 330 degrees C. Heavy vacuum gas oil at 330 to 370 C's. Vacuum residue at 370 Cs and above. That's what comes out the bottom. So I only have to heat my long residue to 370 Cs or 350 if I want to maintain a larger margin of safety to prevent cracking. And why is it called light vacuum gas oil? <coughs> Excuse me. Light vacuum gas oil and heavy vacuum gas oil. The other thing you can note is that you notice this temperature, 170 to 330 Cs. You can go check your atmospheric distillation tower. You can see that light gas oil or diesel is going to be drawn at around this temperature. And likewise, heavy gas oil or atmospheric gas oil is going to be drawn at around 330 to 370 degrees C. 350 uh, if you want the extra safety margin. So. You can see why this is called heavy vacuum gas oil. 
because heavy gas oil will be drawn around this temperature in the atmospheric tower. So the vacuum there is just to tell you, yes, I'm drawing it at this temperature, but in a vacuum. So how does it work? Let me draw a new one. I had to redo this video. Let me draw a new one for you. So we have heated heated long residue out of ink. Heated long residue, right? Oh, excuse me. Yep, there is the heater. And we just came out of that heater. We're going to put it just to the bottom of this tower. It's called a vac tower. The vacuum distillation tower. Now, first of all, you might ask, where does the vacuum actually come from? Turns out that all you need to do is to have a compressor at the top of the, of the, top of the tower that's pumping air and vapor continuously out of the tower. The compressor here. And what happens is that you have a series of condensers, a series of stages to help all these vapors condense at the top. So what they'll draw is some kind of product and whatever they can't condense, they call it non-condensable gases. All right. So that's where the vacuum comes from. Again, just to remind you, this is about 25 to 40 mmHg of mercury. Lower if you want a stronger vacuum, it can go as low as 10. Higher as high as 100 to 150 if you don't want that much of a vacuum. It all depends on your needs and your costs. So, as we know, once the heated long residue comes in, part of it will flash. There will be some of it that will transform into vapor. <coughs> Excuse me. And the rest will go downwards. And we will withdraw the bottom's product as short residue or vacuum residue. And what we know from our atmospheric tower is that we can use steam to strip these short residues, these long, eh, no, these long residues of light ends, whatever is lighter than what is required. So again, this is 370s roughly, or 350. So I have steam here going through. Now this is just a squiggly line to show you that the lines cross, but it kind of gets messy. So we use squiggly lines to indicate that they are not the same stream. Alright, steam will go up the tower, long residue will fall to the bottom, be stripped of its light ends, and steam will be eventually coming up here. So you can see here, you have some oil, vapor, and water vapor, condensed. Condensed. So here I will have a condenser, preferably using cooling water or something like that. <coughs> and somewhere along here, I'll have heavy vacuum gas oil. Somewhere here, light vacuum gas oil. Our question is, where is the reflux? Where is the reflux? Well, from experience or from operations, we know that what comes up here is mostly water because this stuff is already, you know, all the, all the light ends, all the naphtha, all the light liquefied petroleum gas has already come out. And obviously after the pump, there's not going to be much of a vacuum left. So here the oil content is minimal and there's going to be a lot of water. Do you want to send this back into the tower? Not a good idea. Why? Because if you send back hot water into a vacuum tower, there will be an expansion, there will be steam that's produced, and that would be quite catastrophic, and that will make your compressor have to work harder. Because sending back liquid water where you don't need to, it's going to cause expansion, then yes, your vacuum pump will have to work harder to make that vacuum again. Okay? And furthermore, you don't want to contaminate your oil with water anyway. So, we can get our reflux instead from this 
light vacuum gas oil or heavy vacuum gas oil. Now, in our atmospheric tower, we actually have steam side strippers. And then here's the light vacuum gas oil going through a condenser or cooler. So the reflux sometimes goes like this or rather like this. And that's one way of getting our reflux back. But do we need this uh, steam stripper? Well, if you think about it, we actually don't need to, don't need this because this is not a direct product we want to sell. Not for sale. So no need. Because steam strippers are there to strip off the light ends to maintain a certain boiling range of weak vapor pressure. For this, we have no such requirement. So why spend extra money on this steam stripper? <coughs> Might as well, I just cool some of it send some of it back, take some of it out. So this, I don't need it at all. No stream stripper. So our reflux will not come from here, it will come from here. One of the ways is, is that it will come from here. So we take out the heavy vacuum gas oil, again we can reflux some of it, and we draw some of it out. Okay? Now, one other way of having reflux where you don't have to do this and one way that can give you a lot more control is uh, or rather it's just a different way I'm not that sure of the advantages but yes it's just a different way they call this pump around So let's draw the two streams. Short residue at the bottom, steam. Okay, I'm not going to draw the rest. One way is to just draw liquid from here, cool it a bit, just send it back. And this way, I have. I have a way of just controlling the reflux ratio without affecting the rate of draw of, of my product. And I didn't explain it earlier in the last video just, just like not to uh, cause too much confusion because there are just so many ways you can do reflux. Now that the earlier way was the most basic way. Now this is one other way you can do it. Another way of fine tuning and controlling and perhaps it's better heat integration uh, some studies have shown that. But well, just to let you know, that's, that's one extra way of doing reflux. I finally want to explore the trace, the trace structure in the vacuum tower. Now this is what we have in our atmospheric tower. We have many trays, 40 to 60 trays, or 65 even. <coughs> Excuse me. But keep in mind, We have a vacuum on top, and for any liquid to flow through, for any liquid to flow through, there must be some sort of pressure difference. Even for vapors to flow through all this, there's going to be some force needed to force it through. So you can imagine the vapors going up, and then they'll meet some resistance from these trays. Say, no, yeah, I need more pressure. I need more pressure to get through these trays. So each of these trays actually acts as a resistance to this, such that the pressure drop needed to get this long residue up here, the vapors of this long residue up here is going to be very big. So this is more than tolerable. And what happens if the pressure difference here is too big? If my pressure difference here is too big, So let's put P at the flash zone. This is the flash zone. Minus P at the top. Maybe 5 to 40. Or just put 25. <coughs> so we want to have a range of about 25 to 40. 
If my delta P is 100 mm Hg, you know it's way too much. So our flash zone pressure will be have to be about 125. Or if the delta P, the pressure drop needed to get this liquid, the fluid from here to here is too much. It can even go maybe 225. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just guessing figures. But the idea here is that the pressure drop when you use trace is too much. So how can we reduce the resistance to flow so that the pressure drop needed to get fluid from here to here will decrease? Intuitively, we just need to have a less resistance kind of system. So instead of this, I can do this. Alright? We have long residue at the bottom. Vapor will find it easier to go through this because this is like a, a curly pipe. A curly pipe is better than going through this. Like I'm force my way through the each plate through very small holes. I have to force my way through. I have to force my way through. Here, I can just oh, I'll just turn here. I'll just turn here. I'll just turn here, and go all the way to the top, and that's it. My delta P is okay. I solve my delta P problem, my pressure drop problem, by changing the way I separate. I'll do my trays or packing in tower. So what happens for this is that vacuum towers usually have packings inside of them instead of trays. So that's all I have for you in discussion of the vacuum distillation column or vacuum distillation tower. Uh, hope you uh, yeah, satisfied your curiosity and helped you know a bit more. Uh, thanks for watching this video. I shall see you again.